So we would like to welcome you today to Crooked Courage. Crooked Courage. Now you might be thinking, what is that title about? It's one of those titles you can kind of dream, drift yourself into. Whatever you think it is, perhaps that's what it is. So you are on Cricket Courage, and today we have with us Edith Yokely. And so uh, Cricket Courage is all about giving a face to humans. Um, we're in a world now where we're kind of like, I don't know if you remember that movie from a long time ago called Crash. We're crashing into one another and we're rarely meeting one another. And so we're trying to take this opportunity to put a face to humanity, to put a face to human beings. Um, so at our church every Sunday we do this Facebook Live and so you get to meet a lot of professional people that are artists, that are musically inclined and we want you to meet them a little bit more and learn a little bit more about them. So today we have with us Edith Yokely. She is a vegan cook by night. She's a classically trained violinist by day and she is the mother of Kai. We welcome to our podcast Edith Yokely. Hello. Thank you for having me. Good, good, good. So, um, just a question I want to start out with um, uh, asking you is, I was watching this show and the people on the show would introduce themselves by saying who they were the daughter of. And so I'd like to say to you, I'm the daughter of Herman Hill and I'm the daughter of Dorothy Hill. And from listening to Jade, I'm gonna say I'm the daughter of God. <laughs> and I am the daughter of Sojourner Truth. So um, I'd like to ask you, who are you the daughter of? I am the daughter of Joseph Yokely and Maxine Yokely, and God. Okay, you want to go there? So that makes us siblings. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So, um, I wanted to start off with saying, um, not everybody out there knows Maxine Yokely, but your mom is a strong, determined, passionate, black woman. Yes, yes she is. <laughs> And your dad is, you know, transition, but he was a special person as well. So. Yes, he was. So what does it mean to be the daughter of your parents? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. It means that <clears throat> I know that I'm loved, always have been, always encouraged, sometimes, um, special type of encouragement from my mom especially uh, <laughs> who is my greatest critic and my greatest cheerleader so mm -hmm. um, I've learned I'm a hybrid of the two of them I have my dad's humor and wit and <laughs> and uh, people abilities and I have my mom's discerning ear eye uh, not for people She's much better at discerning people than I am, but um, situations. Mm -hmm. So I've learned a lot from both of them. I've, uh, yeah, I've learned a lot from both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually try to start out with light questions. That was a little heavy. It I, was. I could, I could feel you kind of, <laughs> you know, kind of entering into and feeling the weight of that question. Um, it just felt like the first question I wanted to um, ask you. I Can I say something about that? Yes. So I don't really meditate. I pray, mm -hmm. as I think most of us do. Um, but th that question was more like a meditation. Mm -hmm. And it really made me go deep and think and reflect. And I've never thought of a question as a meditation or finding the answer to a question as a mm -hmm. meditation. So maybe that could be a different form of meditation thinking about questions about yourself, who you are, how you came to be. Mm -hmm. I'm try that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, here you have it. Crooked courage. <laughs> so how long have you been, well, I noticed that you have this object in your lap. And uh, so how long have you been playing the violin? Uh, 43, 42, 43 years. So I started when I was two and a half, three. So like, how did that happen? Did your parents just decide to sign you up for lessons they thought it would be culturally enriching or? That's a really good question as well. 
it is because of Sesame Street, PBS and Sesame Street. So I was watching Sesame Street and Grover was on with Wynton Marcellus. And I used to call the trumpet a bugle. And so I asked my mom, can I play the bugle? And she was like, what? And then she realized that I was trying to say trumpet. And she thought about my teeth and braces and she was like, no, let's not do that. I ended up needing braces anyway. Mm -hmm. um, painful. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, I saw Grover with um, Itzhak Perlman, mm -hmm. who is one of the best violinists ever. And um, I asked if I could play the violin, and she said yes. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. how it all began. And so at two and a half years old, they bought you a violin and put you in classes? Mm -hmm. I had a private teacher. And yeah, it all has to do with the discipline, because I've taught two-year-olds. but. Uh, in this day and age, I feel that uh, homeschool two-year-olds are uh, easier to teach because there's some kind of discipline that there. comes with homeschool. Mm -hmm. So was it, was it love at first sight or did that come later? Or is it love at first sight now? I'm making an assumption. You know, that is... Maybe you don't like your violin. <laughs> Yet another meditating question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember it. I remember I loved to perform. Mm -hmm. I loved to get dressed up and go play recitals and stuff like that. And then um, I, I started playing in orchestras. And then that I fell in love with, just to be in the middle of all these sounds and all these different voices uh, swirling together to make this beautiful canvas of, of melody. Mm -hmm. It's just mellifluous. So I have grown to love it more and more. Mm -hmm. It means different things at different parts of my life. So it's actually the connection with people more so than the connection with the instrument? No, you have to have the connection with the instrument in order to have the connection with the people. So, and it's not like you're cheating on your instrument because you're with other people and their instruments, but um, one definitely begets the other. And so I, I love making music with people that feel as passionately as I do about their instruments and the music that we're making. There's, there's nothing better except Kai. So, and we're gonna get to Kai, but so are you saying that for you it's a collaborative effort? Yes. So you like creating music with other people as opposed to playing by yourself? Well, I like that too. Um, <laughs> So there's, a, there's ensemble playing and then there's solo playing. And even with solo playing, you're usually playing with a pianist. So mm -hmm. two of you are making the music together. Um, yeah, I guess I do like the, the collaborative nature of orchestral and um, chamber music playing. So I love it all. I do. I love it all. So did you continue or did you fall off and on with the violin? Like, did you put it down for a period of years or you kept at it? Kept straight. at it straight. Mm -hmm. um, I never wanted to stop. Mm -hmm. Piano, my parents wanted me to take lessons, but I was never really into piano. I mean, I had to take it for undergrad and grad school, but mm -hmm. violin I've never put down. And it's not only that I love playing the instrument, it's what this instrument has afforded me in my life. It's, it's everything, like it's shaped my life. I've traveled all over the world with it, I've met amazing people with it, I've done really cool gigs, you know, it's just, uh, it's a way of life. And people say, oh, well, what do you do when you're not playing violin, when you're not doing mu music? Um, they ask what my hobbies are. My hobby is my life, and my life is my love. So mm -hmm. it's it's all like this. Circle, circle. It's a gift from God. It really is. It is. And so I wonder, I mean, maybe you take it for granted. What is it like to know that you bring this gift to people? Like sometimes people will come up and be like, you get the ugly, or they'll comment about your playing. And it's like really like they've really just been touched. What is it like to be able to share something so precious that it touches people okay. to that degree?
<laughs> Twofold answer. That's a that's a really really good question. So as a musician, a violinist, most musicians are perfectionists. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes up and was like, "Oh, that touched me," I'm just thinking about what I did wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, "Oh, I didn't I didn't bow that properly. That note was a little flat. I didn't play the right note." That's what I'm still I'm still in that headspace after mm -hmm. I play. It mm -hmm. takes a minute to separate. But sometimes when it's glorious and you are feeling it, I don't know, it's, uh, it's special. It's very special. And when you can touch people that way and you can transport them for just five minutes while you're playing mm -hmm. so that they can experience nirvana, God willing, that's what our goal is, to transfigure and figure people's lives so that they're not steeped in whatever pain they're going through, any suffering, the world that we're living in now. That's our goal. So when you can do that, it's, uh, it's a gift. And you pray that you do that all the time, you know, mm -hmm. when you pick up your instrument, mm -hmm. whenever you perform for someone. Wow. But, yeah. twofold, so, I also, you know, people come up all the time and they're like, oh, thank you, thank you. But I don't think you really internalize it until I actually started hearing people that did that for me. And I would go up to them and I'm like, oh, I know how they feel about me coming up, but I have to share, you know? Right. So it's, it's fun to be on both sides of that. Right. So it sounds like it's a little bit hard to receive, like you receive it, mm -hmm. but like your water repellent on yes. a level. Yep. Well yeah. put. Yeah. Totes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So how many places have you lived? I mean, I know you were born here in Chicago and you've done a stint in New York. New York. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's pretty much it. I had little, you know, to school when mm -hmm. I was in school, um, Evanston and then Ann Arbor, then Chicago again, and then New York for seven years. Yeah. And if you could live anywhere in the world, would this be the place? Or where would you where would you want to live? I love Chicago because it's my home, but I would love to live in New York. Mm -hmm. Again, again. Yeah. But I did New York when I was young enough and hungry enough, and I did what I wanted to do there. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to. I could just visit. I would like to have a place in New York. Mm -hmm. but this would be my home yeah I tell people that I, New York for me feels like the adult Disneyland <laughs> I don't know it's like the lights the blitz it always feels like something could be happening in New York it's just something that feeling always happening in New York yes yeah I was like now I understand what they mean when they say it's the city that never sleeps I yes. literally like this is no exaggeration mm -hmm. you can get tofu fresh tofu and scallions at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can go to your local bodega if you're friends with the owners and they'll let you in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and fix you whatever you want. It's, it's a lovely city. Um, and people are like, oh, well, New Yorkers are so brusque and everything is so fast. People have places to go. They do. They, they have do. places to go, but they are also very kind people because if you ask someone a question, they will stop and talk to you mm -hmm. and help you figure things out. I, I've never had a bad uh, experience in New York. Is that true? I'm pretty sure. So, how was it becoming a mother? Because you mentioned earlier about your love for violin and how um, it was almost at the top, and then there's Kai. Mm -hmm. So, how did how did motherhood impact you? Change you, and how did it change or impact your relationship with your violin? So, when I was pregnant with Kai in New York, I was playing on Broadway, Phantom of the Opera, and she used to go crazy, because I was right in front of the bass sometimes, there's six seats in the pit, and when I was in front of the bass, she would just go crazy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then, I remember watching a special on, um, what is that, Jimi Hendrix, she loves electric guitar, I mean, who would have thunk it? So. Then she comes out, and I always go into what's the problem, what do we need to do to fix it, and let's be about the business. So that's how motherhood has been for me. I, 
my goal is to create a God-fearing, God-loving, uh, productive member of society who is happy, who uh, spreads love and light. Mm -hmm. And so that, that has been my focus. And who is intelligent, has a lust for, for learning and the acquisition of knowledge. So that's, that's been my goal. And I have to um, also do violin, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I make our money. I said our money because you know what happens when we're a child mm -hmm. that's no longer your money anymore. So, um, I don't know, I guess it has deepened my love for music and, and for making this a better place because I want her to have a better place mm -hmm. to live in and to inherit. Um, and I have found now, because of COVID, we have been doing homeschooling or remote learning. And so I turn our living room into her little workspace or her little schoolroom, and I sit there and I can honestly say that I have fallen in love with my child, mm -hmm. like really fallen in love with my child because I think you as a mom know this, we're always running and then we drop them off at school, they're at school for eight hours a day, then you see them in the evening, you're cooking dinner, mm -hmm. making sure they do their homework and then they go to sleep, and then you do it over and over again. You don't really get to know your child until you're with them 24-7. Mm -hmm. And so that is what COVID has afforded myself and Kai. Uh, I don't know how she feels about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how she feels about it, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that, that's one of the positive byproducts, if mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. could have any, out of this whole COVID. Yeah, yeah. What relaxes you? Music. Music, music. Mm -hmm. I thought cooking might relax you too. It does. It's very cathartic. Mm -hmm. I do love to cook and I love having dinner parties. Haven't had one in a long time. Having friends over mm -hmm. and just feeding people good food, good conversation, mm -hmm. and laughter. Yeah. Laughter. Yeah. Do you think you're an introvert or an extrovert? Both. I kind of feel the same way. Mm -hmm. So I need my downtime, but I like to be around people sometimes. Yes, yes. Well, and I think both of our professions, you have to be around people. Mm -hmm. And not have to in a bad way, but I mean, that's, that's the job. But yes, I need my, my respite at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So folks listening to us, um, I have a question for Edith that, you know, I've just gotten inconsistent answers. Um, no. Sometimes. No, we're not. <laughs> sometimes she's a vegetarian, and sometimes she's at Popeyes. <laughs> so I just need to know where you are. I mean, no, it's good for people to hear our struggles in life, you know? Oh, so you know. I have so many struggles. So I just want to know where you are these days. Are you on the vegetarian side? Are you on the Popeyes? We're going to get some Popeyes when we get done side. Where are you these days on your food journey? I am betwixt and between people. I, I have been, I made oxtail the other night. Oh gosh. Oh, uh, I haven't had them, but I've been dreaming about them. Yeah, well, about mine? Or no, just another one of my friends posted his jerk oxtails. And so when I looked at them, I was like, that looks good. Well, next time I make them, I'll save you one. Okay. Okay. Um, one's about worth three dollars now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I get you a big one, it's ridiculous. I was just at Sam's Club yesterday, yeah. and I was like, okay, am I gonna do the meat thing or the vegetarian thing? And um, the oxtail, the packages are getting smaller, and you might have three big ones and two little ones, and that's thirteen dollars. Yeah. Did they have them at Sam's Club? They have them at Sam's Club. I don't have them at Costco. You know, I'm a Costco girl. <laughs> oh, the north side. That's what it is. Oh my goodness. So they have them at Sam's Club. Yeah, okay. and they have rack of lamb. Okay. I do love the rack okay. of lamb. So you're on the meat loving side these days. Yes, but I also do veggies. So polenta and turnips, mm -hmm. sauteed mm -hmm. turnips and polenta. Yeah. And I do, I think I'm hard on myself and my, uh, one of my best friends told me, Edith, don't call yourself anything. Don't label yourself. Because mm -hmm. then you don't have to feel bad when you go outside of your label. So, so you could, yeah, maybe let's think. You could say, I'm a conscious eater. You know, that sounds good. Conscious, yeah. 
or a something crooked that's eater. fluid. A crooked eater crooked. with crooked courage. There you go. <laughs> Tie it all together. <laughs> I knew we would live into this title somehow, somehow. So we're almost winding down. We're um, going to get uh, uh, Miss Edith or Edith to play something later for us. She has something special for us. This piece is being created as I play it. I was at the Rocks at Northwestern with a friend uh, this morning before I came here and I was like, I have to play something for this podcast. I don't know what to play. What am I going to do? Am I going to do classical? Am I going to do rock? You know? And so he was like, why don't you just play what you see? You're able to transcribe music. Why don't you try transcribe this view? So I saw um, the lake lapping against this rock and it actually looked like a piece of glass and I've never seen water look like this before. There's music playing in the background. I'm gonna wait until that passes. Water laughing on a rock. I have two last questions for you, and then I'll free you to, you know, eat oxtail or Popeyes <laughs> or or whatever it is. <laughs> What's on your music playlist? I'm gonna assume you have a music playlist. Ooh, wow, all over the place. Um, I was at the beach earlier today, and I was listening to Respighi, Tchaikovsky. Wagner, um, but I'll also listen to uh, Her, H-E-R, mm -hmm. um, a whole bunch of R&B stuff, and then like Neo Soul, so it, I'm all over the place. And I was listening to Skid Row this morning. I think that's wow. what it's called, Skid Row. Wow. 18 in my life to go. Mm -hmm. It's a nice song from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Wow, you do, you do get around. <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave that right there. Yeah. <laughs> so this is our violinist, and on Sunday you get to hear her play uh, what appears to be perfect to her, but not to herself. We've heard about her struggles today, and so the final question I ask everybody on Crooked Courage is, what is on your bucket list to do? Hmm. Just give us one thing if you want to name five. Oh, I can name them. Oh, 
know, I want to go to Dubai. Uh, I want to take Kai to Paris because I promised her I would. Um, there's someone else. What is it about Paris? Because Jay said she wants to go to Paris. So y'all three should hook up and do <laughs> <laughs> What's going on in Paris? <laughs> it was just great. My best friend took me um, some years ago and we just had a lovely time. Mm -hmm. And she had lived in Paris before because she studied abroad. And I think she lived there for a year. And then she went back and was a babysitter or a nanny for a family mm -hmm. there. And I don't know. It's just really, it's a very walkable city, kind of like New York. And it's just beautiful. There's so much history, mm -hmm. um, so much art and culture. So I also want to take Kai to Paris. Yes. And... I would like to, oh, uh, Kai and I want to get an RV, like a really nice RV and a boat. That's it. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll just